What kind of religion is this? So today what I want to do, if anything, you know, I want to tell you that my experience of Islam is that Islam is beautiful and gentle and sweet. And it would make the strongest man weep with joy because of its beauty. And I want to tell you, you know, the world doesn't need miserable Muslims. We don't, we've got enough of those. We don't need any miserable. We need Muslims who smile, and who will attract people to Islam. It's easy to talk. Anyone can give a talk. You know, you can anyone give a speech of mild words. Actions speak louder than words. You know, we can all say the right religious words. I don't want to hear words from anyone. I want to see how they behave. Is this man, you know, he can quote all the Quran he wants. And he can say all the, quote all the hadith of the Prophet, I want to know, is he a kind man? Is he honest? Is he a good husband? Does he work hard in class? These are the things that are important. You know, don't, don't, let's not just make our religion just talk. The world doesn't want talk. It has enough talk. And unfortunately, in this country, you know, sometimes, in this country, society has lost its way, really. And, and religion, and spirituality, and God, it's kind of been made to appear very foolish in Britain. You know, I was in Cambridge the other day, and I, before my talk, the, the, the talk there was called, uh, What Do Muslims Have to Contribute to British Society? And before the talk, I went to Coral Evensong, in one of the churches in Cambridge, Great St. Mary's, opposite King's College. And I was the first one, I went into the church, I was sitting there on my own, and in front of me was the crucifix, Jesus on the cross. And I looked, and I smiled to myself, and I said, well, Idris, you've come a long way, because you can look at that crucifix without feeling the least bit of guilt or remorse. You know, you can look at it, you, you used to believe something about that crucifix, you don't believe any of that anymore. And I sat and listened to the, the music and, and the readings from the Bible, and the reading of the Bible, for example, began, Be holy as the Lord your God is holy. And I said, yeah, that's beautiful, that's nice. And I listened to them singing from the Psalms, and, and it actually, it affirmed my faith as a Muslim being present at that service. But the reason I tell you is because the congregation, there was one woman and me. We were the congregation in the church. I was a Muslim, so the poor vicar just had one person, you know. In the, oh no, and I tell you that two tramps came in halfway through with bottles of beer. And I thought to myself, this is very sad. This is sad for Muslims that there are no people in this church. It's sad because faith and belief in God has dwindled to such a state in this country that religion is made to seem foolish and irrelevant. And, you know, people tell you, you can do whatever you want. Do it indoors. Worship a monkey, smoke marijuana, do whatever you want. But do it indoors. Keep religion, you know, don't bring it into society. We don't want to know. We don't want to hear about it. It's that sad. You know, and I want us to think today, in talking about my own journey to Islam, think about your own. Now again, another introductory remark is this before I begin. <clears throat> I don't know why, of all the places on the face of the earth, I'm in Reading today. I'm in Reading, yes? Reading today. <laughs> today I could be, you know, I could be in Singapore, I could be in San Francisco, I could be in South Africa or in Rome giving a talk about Islam. But I'm here in Reading. Of all the places I could be, I'm here. Why? I don't know. I, I was asked to come. But why I'm here, what the purpose of my being here is, I'm not sure. But there's something I am sure about. Each time that door opens, look this way, okay? I will be losing. Um, there's one thing I'm absolutely certain about, about me, my being here today, and it's this. That Allah Almighty, who made the heavens and the earth and everything in between, planned from the beginning of time, when he created the universe, he planned that I'd be here this afternoon with you. It was part of his plan. And I invite you to think in these next minutes, while you're here, ask, why, why are you here today? Because Allah Almighty planned from the beginning of time that you would be here in this room. It was part of his plan for you. And it may be, you know, it may be that there's a Muslim in this room. We're all good at pretending. We can all talk and put on a good show. Could be there's a Muslim here who doesn't pray. 
And it may be that Allah Almighty has brought all the rest of us here to encourage that sister or that brother to come back to that blessed religion. It could be someone who is not Muslim, in fact doesn't like Islam at all, and has come really thinking, let me pick holes in what he says. You know, well maybe Allah has brought us all here to encourage that person and touch their heart and show them that Islam isn't really what the television says. So I don't know, ask you, and it could well be, could very easily be, that Allah Almighty isn't using my words at all to speak to you. It could be someone who serves you tea, or opens the door for you, or someone you bump into on the field, in the way to the top is the one that he speaks to you through. You understand? We must always keep asking ourselves, what is Allah saying to me today? What does he want me to learn today? When we stop doing that, we've lost it. Really. We should keep asking ourselves all the time, what is Allah saying? In the Holy Quran, you know, the Holy Quran is not history. History is his story. His story is about someone else. Napoleon Bonaparte, that's his story. It's about someone else. Julius Caesar, it's his story. It's about Julius Caesar. The Quran is my story. It's about me. It's about Allah Almighty today, this day. We say, Allah Almighty in the Quran says, we don't say he said, said along with, he says it to you today. So let's listen to what he has to say. We're almost about ready to begin. Uh, I want to begin with, a, with a, 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 something that happened to me two years ago. It was this man. It was um, December 2008. And the Turkish writer, the Muslim Turkish writer, Harun Yahya, invited me to Istanbul to make a television program with him and to discuss some things. Now that's another talk. I can tell you about Harun Yahya, but that's not for today. I went to meet him and we had an interesting thing, we made the program. <coughs> but as well as meeting him, I met two other people in Istanbul. The first one I met was His Old Holiness Bartholomew I, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now the Patriarch of Constantinople is to the Greek Orthodox Church what the Pope is to the Western Church. Okay, so he's a big fish, he's the head of 350 million Greek Orthodox Christians. And I went to his palace on the Bosporus. I was taken in this beautiful corridors by men in white gloves, you know, and, and tailed suits to his study. And, and just accompanying him was Metropolitan Emmanuel of France. It was all very high-powered stuff with, with a big golden staff and a, and a medal on his chair, you know. And the patriarch, very, very sweet man, with a very respectable long Muslim beard going down almost to his knees, I said to him, All Holiness, you honor me and you honor all Muslims by this meeting. And I'm simply here, I don't want anything. I've come for no other reason than to greet you on behalf of Muslims and say that Muslims want to be friends with all people of goodwill and that we respect all people of faith, of any faith, and of none. And we want to speak to them. And, and. So we, we had, I was supposed to say for 20 minutes, well, I stayed, we talked for an hour. And then at the end of the hour, we had to ring my hotel, because I had to leave, I had to check out the hotel. So his secretary had to ring to, to make sure they didn't throw my suitcase out in the street. Because we stayed for an hour, talked for an hour. And then he said, stay, uh, let my secretary show you the, the archives. So I was taken and shown, you know, manuscripts going back to the 3rd and 4th century. And, and the, the, the excommunication of the Pope in 1054, when the Eastern and Western Church is split. And at the end of that hour, he said, now stay for lunch. So my 20 minutes turned out to be three hours. And at the end of the three hours, I was living in Damascus at the time, and I brought with me a present. It was in Damascus, they have these lovely little wooden boxes, inlaid with wood on the top, you know, in arabesque patterns. Very beautiful. And, and th this box, what I did was, I got some of my books, not this one, but some of my books are smaller, and I put them in the box, and there was a space around, and I stuffed the space with chocolates. And at the end, I said, Old Holiness, I have a gift for you. Oh, you shouldn't have bought me a gift. But he was de de delighted to have a gift. <laughs> and, and I said to him, I hope you have a very sweet tooth, because Islam is very sweet. And he said, oh, can we 
with the chocolates now. I said, no, no, they're for you, we can't eat them now. And I went off. And so that was a lovely meeting, first of all. The, the following week, his, his private secretary added me as a friend on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been interesting, because in traveling around the world, if ever I wanted to meet a bishop or an archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church, I've contacted my Facebook friend and said, look, I'd like to meet Metropolitan Yakovos in Chicago. I'll be there next week. And he gets back and says, he's waiting for you. You know? So much so, when I was in New York and I met Archbishop Demetrios of America, he's the head of the Orthodox Church in America. I said, sir, you want to be here? You want to almost be my usual little introduction. He said, your fame goes before you. I thought, how? Because you've never met me before. He said, because the patriarch telephoned me and said, you must see this man and speak to him. So little, little acts of, you know, shaking at someone's hand an act of kindness. You never know what it achieves. Yesterday, while I was at Nottingham, we went to meet the president of the ISA. We went to meet the Lord Mayor of Nottingham. And as a result of it, he's going to the ISA dinner next week. He accepted the president on leaving. He said, oh, by the way, Lord Mayor, could you come to our dinner? I'd love to come. So never take for granted, you know, little acts of kindness. And that's not the point of the story. The point is, as well as meeting the patriarch, I met someone else. I went, now don't throw me out to be told the story. I met the chief rabbi of Turkey. And I went to the, 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 the rabbinate in Istanbul. And I got past the men with, with machine guns and pistols to get in, in the room. And I was taken up to the study of the chief rabbi. And his study is about half the size of this room, maybe a bit bigger, with paintings of all the chief rabbis of Turkey. And here at the end, a big portrait of Kemal Ataturk, the founder of secular Turkey. That's another talk. We'll give that talk some other time. And the chief rabbi was dressed in the robe <coughs> of the chief rabbi. And in Turkish, he's called Hahambasha. There are very Turks here, but I hope I pronounce it right. Hahambasha. Because in 1453, Sultan Mehmed II conferred on the leader of the Jewish community the title Chachambasha, which means chief wise man. He was made chief wise man of the Ottoman Empire. And the patriarch was given the title leader of the Orthodox peoples in the Ottoman Empire. And what were the Jews doing there in 1453? They had fled from Catholic Spain where their, mosque, where, where their synagogues were being burned down with the Jews inside them. And they fled, where to? To Muslim Turkey. And they've lived there ever since in, in peace and happiness with their neighbors. The importance of the story was this. I said to the chief rabbi, sir, you honor me and you honor all the Jews by this meeting. I said, but there's something we need to say before we carry on. Because if you think that my being here in your office with all of your counsel, if you think this means that I am some way approving the so-called Israel, or in any way approving Zionism, or what's happening to my brothers and sisters today in Palestine, I have to leave because we have nothing to talk about. But if as a man of God, as a man of faith, we can talk about the one God in whom we believe. Well, I believe we have a lot to talk about. And he took me by the arm. And he said, so you're a very wise man. Please stay. And we laughed and joked. Again, 20 minutes turned to an hour. We laughed and joked. And at the end, he took my arm and he said, tell your Muslim friends that the chief rabbi of Turkey said, Muslims and Jews have one phrase in common. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but the one God in heaven. The point of my story is, is that at the end of that meeting, I went back to Damascus. And a few days after that, the, the, the F-16 fighter jets headed into Gaza and started dropping bombs on little old ladies carrying their shopping and, and children playing in the street and young men cycling home <coughs> from work at lunchtime. And I, I went back to Cairo, where I live. And at the time, I was writing for a, an English newspaper in Cairo, and I said to the editor, why don't I, tomorrow I go to the hospital? There's a hospital called Mustache or Mahad al um, Victory Institute Hospital. And in that hospital, there were many men and boys from Gaza who'd lost their legs and their arms and everything they had. 
and they were being treated very well in the hospital. So I said, I'll go for half an hour, write my story, we'll put it in the newspaper. So he said, yeah, great. So I went, and instead of staying for half an hour, I stayed for four hours, because I couldn't drag myself away. Because that day, I met real Muslims. You know, we call ourselves Muslims. We talk about calling people to Islam, giving them dawah. We don't even get up in the morning to pray. Who are we trying to fool? And yet these men and these boys, they've lost their arms and their legs and their babies for the sake of, for the sake of Islam. And, and when I finish, I can give you a long talk about them. But at the, at the end of the, the, the afternoon, I mean, my heart was breaking, I couldn't stay anymore. I said, look, I haven't got any money to give you. I haven't got any money, I've got no money in the bank. I've got no money <coughs> but I promise you that from this day forward, wherever I go in the world, I will always mention the people of Palestine to my Muslim brothers and sisters, so we never forget you. And I will always wear a lapel badge of the flag of Palestine until the land of Islam is free once more from oppression. And I wrote a book about that as well. So that's how we start. That's how we start. I, you know, I used to, I was a Roman Catholic priest once. I have in my heart nothing but love for the people I lived with all my life. If anyone has, I'm not quite sure what the talk is entitled, but if anyone's come here waiting for me to criticize the church, or the Pope, or the Bible, or whatever, you come to the wrong talk. Because I've got nothing bad to say about any of You know, I don't agree with the message anymore but the people I love with all my heart. And to prove it, I'll tell you a story. The first, the very first time I met Pope John Paul II, the great Pope John Paul II, it, it was in Rome, and it, every first Saturday of the month, John Paul used to hold a service, a rosary service. Now, just as Muslims have used Sipra, to say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, what one, Roman Catholics use something a bit like it, called a rosary. And they asked, using the rosary, they asked Mary, the mother of Jesus, to pray for them. Catholics don't worship Mary, don't think they do, they don't. But using the rosary, they asked Mary, the mother of Jesus, to pray for them. So the Pope has this, had this meeting every first Sunday. And if on the television you've ever seen the Pope come out on Easter Day or Christmas Day, on the balcony of St. Peter, he comes out like this. You've seen him? And he gives a blessing to the world. And behind him, there's a row of windows. The whole front of St. Peter's, there's a row of windows. Well, I'll let you into a secret. Behind those windows is just one room. Just one room behind them. It's a long, a long, narrow room. I'll put it this way. Long, narrow room. The windows to St. Peter's Square. And there's an aisle, one aisle down the middle, and about seven chairs on this side, and seven on that side, very, very deep. And I was told... But it, I was trained to be a priest. I was told, if you get, if you go and queue up at the great bronze doors of St. Peter's at about 3 o'clock, it started at 8 in the evening. If you're there at 3, you will get to meet the Pope. It was like an m and &M concert, you know? You get there early enough and you get to meet the star. So I queued up at all the nights at 3 in the afternoon. And we talked and until it was time and the big doors opened and we lifted our skirts and ran as fast as we could through the apostolic palace to the room itself and I got myself sitting just where this brother is in blue okay what's your name brother? Cameron. Cameron. Cameron sitting just where you are so I, I was on the aisle so I knew the Pope would come here and down here and I'd shake his hand okay? so the Pope came in up here on this side and even then, this is, we'll say, 15 years ago, he was old and frail and he was being shot and broke his hip. And so he came, and all the people were shouting in different languages, I'm from China, I'm from Spain, I'm from Pakistan, I'm from South America. And even though he spoke all of their languages, I could see it wasn't sinking in what they were saying, because they were all clamoring and shouting, okay? So I said to myself, okay, you've got to think of something to keep him. Because unless you say something, he's just going to walk past. Okay? Brother, you come and be the poet for one second. Just come. Okay. <laughs> so he went and prayed, and then he came down my side, and he came to me and shook my hand. Okay? Okay, take your hand away now. <laughs> the Pope was going nowhere. Okay? <laughs> right. So he talked for a while, and uh, I can't remember what he said. And then 
he, he used to have this phrase, he used to say, when it was time to end a meeting, he'd say, the Pope is very busy. And that meant, that's the end of your meeting. But I still had hold of his hand, so he pulled his hand. And the gold ring of St. Peter on his, on his right hand came off, and I ended up in the palm of my hand. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, I believe that belongs to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and, he took it back. and I saw him many times. So, and and, and when, when John Paul was dying on the Polyclinical Germany in Rome, the Muslims of Rome offered prayers for his recovery during Salaf al on Friday. They prayed for the Pope of Rome. Why? Because, well, they loved him for various reasons. Some years before, the Muslims of Rome had been trying to build a mosque. And, and there had been demonstrations in the streets calling for a new crusade to stop these infidels coming to the Eternal City. I, I remember seeing them. And it took the intervention of the Pope himself to convince the Italian government that the Muslims build their mosque. And then as well, towards the end of his life, he encouraged the Catholics of Rome every Friday of Ramadan to fast with their Muslim neighbors. So the Muslims loved him very much. And when he died, a whisper went around Rome amongst the Muslim community. Now, now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The whisper was the Pope became Muslim on his deathbed. Now I don't know whether he did or he didn't. No idea. No idea. Allah alone knows that. But what it proves is how much they loved him. You know the son in your lecture, in your class, that you really like, is not Muslim, and you think, if only they could be Muslim. It's the nicest thing you could wish them, isn't it? You want them to be Muslim. So it shows how much they loved him in saying he became Muslim. Right? Now I'm telling you that story, and the first one, to show, you know, beyond any doubt at all, in my heart I have great love for those people who make me the person I am today. And you know, and some people say, what a change in your life. You were going like this, 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 and all of a sudden you turned and went like that. I see no change in my life. I see a straight line from the day I was born to being here. And I can see now <clears throat> that when I was sitting in a lecture hall, like you in Rome, learning about New Testament Greek and church history and, and all of these things, I wasn't studying to be a priest. I was studying to be talking to you today. You know, that was our last plan all along. So I thank and bless those people, you know, who brought me to where I am. I disagree with them. In fact, to be perfectly honest, the true word is I feel sad for them. Because these are good people. I, you know, you meet good people. I, I take no offense to anyone who might be Christian in the audience. Good people who, who pray and, and who read their scriptures and are kind. You don't help the poor. And it seems to me how sad. These are good people. And they believe a message that's wrong. You know, and some Muslims, unfortunately, they speak, but we use very harsh words in talking of others. This is wrong. We don't use harsh words. How could we be harsh? As Muslims, we've received the fullness of revelation. We've been told everything there is to know. How could we be harsh with people who haven't? We should be tender and kind and merciful with our Christian friends, not harsh. You know, and if they want to argue with us, I'll let them argue. You know, if people, I say to people who come, you know, sometimes people come with notepads and Bibles and they want to quote me and make this one. I say, look, if you, if you want to play games, you've won. I'm not into playing games. Okay? I, so you've won. You've won the argument. I don't do debates. You know, we, we don't do that. We don't need to persuade and trick people to, to believe what we believe. If they don't want to believe it, fine, it's up to them. To you, your religion, and to me, mine. And we sleep well in our beds. And Allah Almighty doesn't need any more Muslims. We have enough who don't pray without adding to their number. You know, so getting more Muslims adds nothing to his greatness. Nothing at all. All that happen, people who become Muslim, they are the winners, not Allah. Allah doesn't get anything by it. We're doing him no favors in having dawah stalls and all the giving out pamphlets, you know, having Islamic weeks to <coughs> get people to be Muslim. So the stage is set. Now I've got kind of 10 minutes to tell you my journey to start. 
When I was your age, I left university and I entered a religious order. I'll do it very quick. I entered a religious order, a religious teaching order. So all my life, I taught in schools. I lived in a religious community. I became part of the community. Um, and we, we taught kids about the Christian religion. Um, and I was head of RE in different schools in England and Wales for a long time. And then at the end of many years, I went to the bishop and said, uh, Your Grace, I would like to take my, 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 my life a little bit further. Instead of just working with kids in school, I'd like to work with people in a parish. I'd like to become a priest. Now, I was very clever, and I knew that the bishop had two places he could send me to train to be a priest. He could either send me to the local theological college, the local seminary, which was in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere, with not a shop in sight, or he could send me to Rome. So I prepared myself well, and he said, oh, brother, um, what are your interests? I said, my interests? Oh, I like uh, Italian architecture, Italian opera, uh, travel. Uh, he said, well, maybe I should send you to Rome. I said, oh, that would be nice. <laughs> and I went to Rome for five years, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I learned about beautiful things in Rome, and I met good people and bad. Well, we leave the bad. There's no need to reflect on those. I met lovely people. Mother Teresa of Calcutta working with the poorest of the poor, John Paul. Many good nuns and priests trained me and so on. And at the end of my time in Rome, I was a day the deacon, and I uh, was like half a priest. And I returned to the UK and was ordained a priest. And so I, I went to work in a parish. And it's a very privileged occasion to be a priest. People let you into special privileged moments in their lives where their children are born and you baptize their children. Their parents are dying and you anoint their parents. You marry the people and you hear their confessions, the most intimate thoughts they have. You celebrate them. So it was a very privileged occasion. And the people loved me and I loved them and I was good at my job. I was very good at my job. But the important thing is this. This is important to remember today. Allah Almighty speaks to each one of us in a different way. He speaks to the person that we are. So there's someone maybe who's interested in science, whose mind is very scientific. Well, Allah speaks to that person in <coughs> science. So the miracles of the Quran, the scientific miracles of the Quran, speak to those people. They leave me cold because I don't understand them. I don't understand science. I haven't a clue about it. Other people, he speaks artistically, he speaks to a beautiful sunset or a mountain scene, and that reminds them of Allah, the creator of the world. He spoke to me, he brought me closer to him through my heart. You know, I was good at my job, I was very good at my job, and I liked it. And I had no problem at all with the church or the teaching or the bishop or anything, but my heart wasn't happy. I was lonely as a priest. I was lonely. You know, you work with people all day long. And then at night you'd go home to an empty house and sit on your own. And it, it became too much for me and I, and I said, I'll have to leave this. I had no plan to give up my religion at all, none. I was just changing my job. So I left the priesthood. And leaving the priesthood, it's like a death and a divorce and your house burning down all rolled into one. It's a big deal. And I felt really low. Now, sisters, you know when you're feeling low, you go out and you buy yourself a new hijab to cheer yourself up. Yeah. Or, or the brothers, you buy yourself a pair of trainers or a CD to cheer yourself up. Well, I needed a holiday. I said, you need to get away, go to the sunshine. Get away from... Well, I had no money, so I went to the internet to look for the cheapest holiday I could find. And the cheapest holiday was to Egypt. Now, I knew nothing about Egypt at all. Sand, pyramids palm trees, oh yeah, and Muslims. Now I had a bit of a problem there because I knew then what everyone knows about Muslims in Britain, that they chop your hands off and they blow themselves up and they hit women. And I knew all of that. And I thought, well, if I go to Egypt, these Muslims might kidnap me. <laughs> or they might chop my neck, you know, and, or hold me for ransom for years and years in a darkened room. Now why am I going to do it? But I've got no money. So I had to make my choice. You either go or you stay here. So I went. And that week changed my life, really. It changed my life. Because for the first time in my life, I met Muslims. I'd seen them in Britain. I'd seen Muslims in the street. 
but no one talks to Muslims. I mean, we've seen that with veils, long beards. I didn't talk to any of these people. But I went to I went to Cairo, and the first oh, this is very important. If you remember nothing else, remember this. The first Muslim I ever met, my introduction to Islam came not from some big sheikh giving a talk. It didn't come from reading a book about Islam or watching a television program on an Islamic channel or even opening the Holy Quran. None of those things. My introduction to Islam came from a little boy in the street, about 14 years old, cleaning shoes in Shara Ramses in Cairo. And he was, he was thin and he was wearing a, a shabby galabaya. It wasn't dirty, but it was shabby and he was wearing little plastic slip tops on his feet. And I walked towards him. I was, my hotel was near my water. Was, and his face lit up when he saw my white skin. And he said, As-salamu And he meant it. He meant it. Peace be upon you. And for the rest of the week, I walked past the boy. And I learned, because he was a nice little lad, and I, and, I, and I learned some words in Egyptian to say to him. So when I pass it each morning, I'd say, Zayat. Zakir Habibi, Zakir Gamil. <laughs> and he'd reply, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. That was his answer. And you know, he touched my heart. He really touched my heart. And, and that would, this is important, you know, that boy, he doesn't know that I became Muslim a year later. He never saw me again. And he's probably married with children of his own now, grown up. But that boy on Judgment Day is going to get the shock of his life. Because when he appears on Judgment Day before Allah Almighty naked and his sins and his good deeds are read out to him, it will be read out from a clear book the good things he did. You did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. And he'll think, yeah, well that's it, I didn't, didn't do anything else, that's the lot. Only then will it begin. Then will be read out all of the shahadas that have been declared all over the world because of him. All the books that have been written because of him. The articles in newspapers, the television programs, the radio broadcasts, the university talks, all because of him. SubhanAllah. I know, my, I'm such a lucky man, traveling around the world. I, I get to see the fruits of my work. People write to me and say, Brother Idris, I have come back to praying after seven years. I have given up alcohol. I finished with my boyfriend. Or others, I see them declare shahada. What a wonderful thing. Most people in life, you won't see the fruits of your goodness until judgment day when it will be read out to you. So when you go into the student union, you know, and you greet people with a smile on your face, and by your good manners and your good behavior, they see you're a Muslim. On judgment day, that's where your reward will come from. You know, I don't know what what, what people say of you at this university of Reading. Prophet Muhammad was described by Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. You know, they asked her, what was he like? She said, he was a walking Quran. What do they say about you at Reading University? When they see you, do they say, oh, that's a Muslim. How do you know it's a Muslim? Not by the way they dress, but by the person they are. That person, the person of prayer, that person is trustworthy and honest and hardworking and kind and charitable and a really loyal friend. Is that what they say? Or not? I don't know. You know I, I, I'll be leaving soon. I don't know what they say. You, you work that one out for yourself. Do you show them a walking Quran? Or do you show them something else? Do you, saw, do you show them a Muslim that drinks? You know, a Muslim that has a girlfriend? I don't know. Anyway, that's the little boy. At the end of my week, I could talk about that week in Cairo for, I could do a seminar on it to the people I met. At the end of the week, I didn't know much about Islam, but I knew that Muslims were not the saber rattling maniacs that the television told me. I knew that they were nice people. So I went home, back to the UK, and I had no job. So I got myself a job um, as head of RE in a school in London. A really rough school. The roughest school I've ever been in in my life. These were naughty kids. 
They were really, there were guns and knives and all kinds of mischief in the school. And my job was to teach these kids. All six world religions. Previously, my job was to teach about Christianity. Now I had to teach about Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Well, I knew about Christianity, and I knew enough about Judaism to teach kids about it. But the other four, I knew nothing about. So every night before the lessons, I had to get the books out. Let me let you into a secret. Sometimes your teachers don't know what they're talking about. I had to get the books and read about Islam to teach the kids the next day. And there was an added thing to this as well, that many of these kids were from Arab countries. They were from North Africa and from Lebanon and from Iraq. The naughtiest of all were the Yemeni boys. They were really the naughtiest boys I've ever met in my life, followed very closely by the Somali boys. But, none of, but they were Muslim too. And so these kids were teaching, I was teaching them about Islam, but they were teaching me, you know, by the words they'd say and, and by the way they'd interact, they were teaching me about Islam. And Ramadan came, several months on, and the boys came to me and they said, Sir, it's Ramadan and we've got nowhere to pray. And your classroom is the only classroom in the school with, no, with, with a carpet. What a coincidence. Hey, my classroom was the only classroom with a carpet and a wash basin. And they said, can we pray in your class? So I said, oh, I'd love you to, but I'd better check with the headmaster first. So I went to the head and said, look, these Muslim kids, they want to pray in my classroom at lunchtime. Is it okay? He said, yeah, it's fine. But you must what supervise them, because knowing these kids, they will steal the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with them. So during, during Ramadan, I'd sit at the back of the class, marking my books, I'm preparing my lessons, and the kids would pray in front of me. And for the first few days, I paid no attention. Then after a day or two, I, I began to look at, oh, they're doing this now. Oh, now, now they're doing this. So that by the end of Ramadan, I knew what you did to pray, because I watched them. And then as well, I secretly went off to the internet, and I learned off by heart in Arabic what they were saying. So by the end of Ramadan, I learned how to pray. And as well... At the start of Ramadan, when they said, can we play in your, play in your room? I said, okay, you honor me by doing that. So I will fast with you during Ramadan. I'm not Muslim, but to encourage you, I'll fast with you. So at the end of Ramadan, I'd learned how to pray, and I fasted for the whole of the holy month. So then more time went on, more months. And by this time, I was very comfortable with Muslims. Very comfortable with them. They're good, honest people, prayerful people. So I said to myself, it's time you start going to learn a bit more about Islam for yourself, not for teaching, but for your own spiritual life. So I went to Regent's Park Mosque on a, on a Saturday afternoon, 3 o'clock. There's what's called Islamic Circle. It still goes on. For new Muslims, those was interested in Islam, Muslims who just want a little boost in their faith, talks about Islam. And again, the people were very kind and... It was very non-threatening. No one came as a joy to be Muslim. They left me alone. It was very, very nice. And the very last talk of all was given by Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, the singer. And again, I don't remember what he said, but at the end of the talk, I went to him. I plucked the courage and went and said, excuse me, if someone wanted to be Muslim, what would they have to do? I don't want to be one, I said, but say someone did. What would they have to do? He said, well, Muslims believe in one God. I said, yeah, I believe in one God. He said, and Muslims pray five times a day. I said, well, well actually, I, I know the prayers in Arabic. And he looked at me, that's strange. And he said, and Muslims pray five times a day. Uh, and Muslims fast during Ramadan. I said, well, actually, I, I fasted in Ramadan. And just as the Pope had done, he looked in my eyes and he said to me, you are Muslim already. Who are you trying to fool? And with those words, what, you, you're Muslim already, who are you trying to fool? The Adan sounded. And we were in the basement of the mosque. And I got up to pray, Salah al with the prayer room. And I was like a drunken man going downstairs to the prayer room. Because all I could hear in my mind was, you are Muslim already, who are you trying to fool? And this, Allahu Akbar. So 
So I went up and, and the brothers prayed in the in the in the hall, the prayer hall, and the sisters in the beautiful balcony at the bottom. And I sat myself at the back and the prayer started and I began to cry. And I cried and I cried and I cried like a baby. And it was as if the angels came down into the mosque and just filled the mosque with peace and serenity and calm. And I said to myself, this this really is it. You, everything has led you to where you are today. So I got up and went to use it. And I said, Brother, I want to be Muslim. Tell me what to do. And he said, You can say these words after you say, I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no being worthy of worship, no created being worthy of worship. But the one God in heaven. What I should have one Muhammad or Rasulullah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. So I said these words, and uh, all the brothers came and congratulated me. And uh, every time I tell the story, I cry. <laughs> All the brothers congratulated me. And Yusuf Islam said to me, Brother, what you must do now is go home and take a bath or a shower. Because he said, you are the best Muslim in this mosque. You are without sin. All the sins of your life have been forgiven. It's like you've just been born. So I went home and, and we did that. I felt, felt that. And since the times run out, since then, I found myself, you know, I had no plan ever talk about it, talk to anyone about Islam. What do I know about Islam to tell anyone? Uh, and then, first of all, I was invited by my uh, local imam to give a talk uh, about my journey, and then a newspaper said, tell us your story, and then a radio. And then I found myself traveling all over the place, meeting beautiful, beautiful Muslims, the best of Muslims all over the world. When I go back to Egypt next week, I'll be home for two weeks, then I'll go to Sri Lanka, and then I'll go to Kuala Lumpur again for the fourth time. And then I'll come back and I'll go to Bahrain. What a wonderful life. What a job. What a job. What it is a job. Just talking about Islam. What kind of job do you have when you turn up, people clap? It's a fantastic job, really. Just talking about it. So, so my journey, what I haven't been able to tell you, because there isn't time, is, you know, I'm not a fool. I'm not a stupid man. And so there was a lot of thinking went on in that year. A lot of thinking. You know, I used to believe this, and I ended up believing this. So how did I get from there to there? I had to think a lot and wrestle with ideas in my mind. But more than anything else, you know, I say to people when they come to me and they say, "Oh, I'm thinking about being Muslim," they want to be Muslim already. They know they do, but they're looking for excuses. And I say, "Oh, I'm thinking, but I'm not quite sure. You know, what will my mum think? And what will I say?" I say to them, "Look, we can't." allow what-ifs to ruin our life. If something is right, we should do it. If it's wrong, we don't do it. And that's true of anything in life, you know? Don't let what-ifs affect the way you behave. What if this, that, what if. Forget that. If it's right, do it, and Allah Almighty will give you the strength to do what needs to be done. Now, the time has run out, so um, we'll have maybe a few questions which can cover other things. I could go on for ages and ages, but that's enough. It just gives you a glimpse. Just a few things. My website, idristafi.com, www.idristafi.com, all one word. In the video section, there's loads of things, you know, telling my story on TV. In the bio section, it's all written down in Arabic or in English, so you can learn that. And there are articles in there. And then there's Facebook, there's Idristafi Group, or you like the Patriarch Secretary, you could add me as a friend. And, you know, I send you out articles and, and tell you where I'll be next week and all that sort of thing. Thank you very much for being so attentive. You know, even though the door opens from time to time, and it's the worst time of the afternoon. Thank you very much for honoring me and uh, building up my faith. As-salamu alaykum.